Hello, and welcome to My Sex Bio's uh, May edition of Fucking Capitalism. My name is Pierce Delahunt. I am the facilitator for this ongoing series. Um, and uh, you're watching May's edition. We're going to get into it. A uh, couple disclaimers. Um, my name is Pierce Delahunt. I am an activist educator. I call myself a social emotional leftist. I'm also very privileged uh, as a white, hetero, uh, wealthy, cis male. Um, I am not uh, profiting off of these classes. If you come, uh, you will be asked to donate toward My Sex Bio. All those proceeds go to My Sex Bio's other staff and their operating expenses, um, not to me. Um, and then <clears throat> this one, uh is gonna get a little more medical and i want to be clear i am not a doctor um i do not study anatomy so we're gonna keep everything very basic um unfortunately there's plenty of uh history to talk about how uh the fundamentals of uh, what we're talking about are so corrupted by uh white supremacists uh, hetero, cis, patriarchy, capitalist domination culture. Um, and we'll get into that. Um, great. Uh, without further ado, uh, this is May's fucking capitalism, which is uh, patriarchy in genital science and genital medicine. Um, and we're going to uh, be focused on everything medically accurate. Want to emphasize that uh, we are science grounded here. Um, and at the same time, you know, we can have fun with it. While I was creating this, I was listening to Pussy Riot to help get me in the mood. Um, and I think uh, the basis of everything we're going to be talking about can basically be summarized with one of their lines. Don't play stupid. Don't play dumb. Vagina is where you're really from, which uh, aside from some uh, outliers, is a medically accurate statement. Um, great. Uh, so first we're going to cover uh, how patriarchy has influenced genital science and genital medicine um, by part, uh, and then we're going to go through by timeline. Um, so let's get it on. Um, so some things to know about. Uh, there is the vulva versus the vagina, parentheses versus the urethra, vagina and urethra, two different things. Um, urethra is uh, the P passage, vagina is the reproductive passage. And the vulva versus the vagina, that's the difference between the external and the internal genitalia. Um, there uh, is something that uh, at the bottom here, Dr. Harriet Lerner, uh, who's a clinical psychologist, she calls it psychic genital mutilation. What is not named does not exist. And the fact that uh, we typically colloquially refer to the entirety of the female genitalia as the vagina, um, uh, rather than acknowledging the external uh, genitalia of the vulva. Um, and in fact, like most medical textbooks will cover the internal you'll like i have you know a memory of the fallopian tubes that imagery in my head i don't think that i have ever seen in my own education uh in any health class or sex ed class uh depictions of the entirety of the external genitalia uh including the uh labia majora or minora the clitoris and all that um and uh, that is a, a psychic genital mutilation. Reminder that May's, uh, my sex bio theme for the org is uh, genital, female genital cutting and mutilation. Uh, cool. Uh, so some things to be aware of there. Um, the condition of hysteria, the root of the word comes from uterus and the condition was named because it was believed that that condition was caused by the uterus wandering around. Um, and uh, sometimes history presents us with metaphors that are almost too perfect, but the idea that uh, a uterus does, that does not know its rightful place is creating 
uh, these uncontrollable women. Uh, I think I think that that says a lot. Um, and I do want to acknowledge that uh, I I will be slipping in and out of. I'm trying not to, but I'll be slipping in and out of language that um, uh, is uh, cis normative. Um, I'm I'm working on that. Um, but that these uh, these parts can be had by uh, people of all genders as well. Um, but we will be focusing on these parts of the body. Um, thank you for uh, your patience in that with me. Um, the hymen, uh, it is not a virginity detector. Uh, it's not something that you pop, uh, which is like a very violent way to think about uh, that situation. Um, and such tests in the US are still, in fact, happening. Uh, there was a, a case um, of a celebrity who take who took his daughter and, in fact, may still do that uh, for her, for hymen checks. That's not how that works. Um, there's, there is no medical way to assess virginity. Uh, virginity itself is uh, just a construct that cannot be medically detected in that way. Um, and and I want to emphasize that a lot of people have these ideas that these are problems happening outside of the US, um, but there's plenty happening inside the US and we'll, we'll get into that too. Um, okay, here we go. The clitoris, it exists. Uh, the G-spot exists. Vaginal ejaculation exists. The fact that like those things are controversial. Um, some, some of medical doctors still have doubts around this and we'll talk about that a little bit but it's it's a it's a really unfortunate statement of where things are today um some things i want to emphasize the clitoris um it it is not a source of heightened pleasure necessarily it can be but i think when we constantly talk about it that way it makes it sound like it's just a button right that you can just fucking just jab at like that. And that sounds fucking horrible and painful. Um, so it's heightened sensation, uh, which means, you know, be gentle with it, at, at least at first, maybe later. Um, I don't want to get too much into that. But uh, yeah, I think it's an important frame that it's sensation, heightened sensation, not heightened pleasure necessarily. Uh, the G spot it does exist the controversy that i can see from within the actual medical community um seems to be around the fact that it is a, a kind of general zone again it's not a button um and that there are different degrees of sensation for everyone some people aren't like super turned on by g-spot stimulation um and that's fine uh it, it's still a spot that exists and also the name of it is named after a uh, a male researcher um which like that that's a more example of like people were familiar with the there there were people familiar with the g-spot and we'll talk a little bit about that before a male researcher found it um so so that's a thing <sighs> moving on uh vaginal ejaculation it also exists not everyone who has a vagina has vaginal ejaculation um but uh if that if if it is still controversial uh even in uh matters of the uk actually has a law that says as a matter of law that vaginal ejaculation does not exist and uh, the fallout of that is that any depiction in pornography or, or any footage of, uh, of vaginal ejaculation as a matter of law, therefore must be uh, urine, urination in, in a sexual act, uh, which is considered legally, according to the UK, obscene um, and is therefore that content is illegal. Um, so that's some of the fallout from the idea that vaginal ejaculation does not exist. And you can imagine, you know, a lot of stigma comes from that um, and, uh, you know, representation matters. And it kind of, again, goes into this psychic genital mutilation. Uh, like the, the fact that uh, 
these three key things that are parts of a body are even controversial in regard to their existence uh, is a kind of, of erasure of people, um, not to mention all the other myths around them. Um, so that is just a very superficial breakdown of patriarchy uh, as in, in genital science medicine as per the parts of the body. Um, now we're going to move into the history. Um, and for that, uh, we are going to be uh, borrowing heavily from this amazing book. I cannot recommend it enough. It's a comic book. It's, it's uh, not academic or heavy at all. Um, it, it flies by because it's, um, well, the, the, I'll say the content can be heavy emotionally, um, but it is presented uh, very uh, entertainingly um, and it's super engaging uh, by a, uh, I believe she's a Swedish uh, writer, illustrator, Liv Stromquist, uh, The Volva versus the Patriarchy gives you a sense of uh, her angle. Um, and so uh, the comic book's not written in chronological order, but I've kind of broken it down so that way. So that's what we're gonna, that's the presentation we're gonna go with right now. Um, so some key things, uh, tribal nations before uh, white supremacist, heterosis, patriarchal domination, capitalist domination culture uh, took over. Um, they were far more egalitarian, that's what the equal sign there means, um, which is not to say that every tribal nation uh, was not uh, problematic in some way, just as a, a generality, um, tribal nations uh, of which there were tens of thousands um, were, were more egalitarian than today's culture uh, in regard to a lot of things, but especially sex and gender here. Um, and they were far more familiar with the human body uh, at a at a general public level um, than than we are today, where we don't even know that the clitoris, G spot, or vaginal ejaculation exists uh, as as a general public knowledge. Um, and it wasn't until after uh, the uh, white supremacist civilizational uh, order took over uh, that we had. Um, there, there's a couple different kinds of sexisms we're going to go through. There's the ancient sexism, which said that women are ruled by the body. Uh, and that's where uh, their lasciviousness and lustfulness and uh, uncontrollability come from, uh, because they're ruled by these, these hormonal urges, uh, whereas men are ruled by higher things like reason and, and are more noble. And that's why we're fit to govern, we, we men. Um, and, and you'll see how uh, different iterations of sexism uh, contradict each other. And, and that's where uh, the vestiges of, of previous sexisms, which still play out today, uh, contradict each other. And surprise, the patriarchy is not an internally consistent ideology, because um, injustice cannot be. Um, so that's ancient sexism. Uh, then in, in, in an appeal to uh, worship and, and the gods or God, uh, religious sexism uh, just relied on the fact that uh, it was God's will um, that women, you know, uh, were uh, not the, the chosen gender in that way, um, which was arguably depending on specifics um, of, of history and, and uh, culture, the specific culture in question, uh, it was more like a post hoc justification for the ancient sexism that was already there. Um, and there are theories as to like how that came about too, including um, uh, once we transitioned from uh, more uh, hunter-gatherer uh, culture into a totalitarian agriculture uh, revolution, um, that that put a premium on upper body strength. Uh, so there, there's some ideas around that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, then religious sexism came in and said, well, the reason it's like this is because it's God's will. Um, and uh, that had a couple things going on. One was that it put this stigma then on 
basically women with autonomy, including midwives, especially women who could encourage other women to have autonomy, to know their bodies. Um, and that's where uh, a lot of the witch burning comes from, uh, is this, uh, and in that transition from feudalism to capitalism, um, that uh, the book Caliban and the Witch talks about, which we've brought up in this uh, series before, excellent book by uh, Silvia Federici, who, who studies this uh, aspect of history, um, that uh, there was then a professionalization uh, and elitism uh, put into the system of uh, medicine as a whole, but especially um, in for our conversation, uh, reproductive autonomy and and uh, women's health and, and those kinds of things. Um, and and so then doctors became the gatekeepers, right? You couldn't uh, have a healthy relationship with your body without seeing a doctor uh, rather than being able to organize uh, amongst yourselves and be empowered in that way uh, so that, you know, you knew your body. Um, and then that, uh, once once that kind of transition happened, uh, that paved the way for scientific sexism rather than uh, an emphasis on religion. Um, but if they're, if we're moving towards scientific sexism, now you can't just say, well, it's God's will anymore. Um, now you have to point to uh, quote unquote scientific differences uh, between the sexes and genders. So uh, interestingly, uh, during religious sexism, there was actually a lot more sense that the uh, the female and male bodies were equal in terms of being bodies, but one was morally deficient or whatever. Whereas scientific sexism came along, and then that needed to point to biological differences in order to justify the itself. Um, and there's a huge overlap of scientific sexism with scientific racism. Um, and uh, and that goes into vulvophobia, uh, just the fear of uh, of the external genitalia. Um, there, uh, the big example of this is someone named Sarchi or Sarah Bartman, uh, who died in approximately 1815. Um, but uh, she uh, is an African woman who was kidnapped uh, by. Uh, white human traffickers and showcased by one doctor uh, in, a, in a kind of human zoo situation. Um, and uh, they, they particularly emphasize that like the, the large vulva that she had, uh, that they claimed was typical of her people, um, that, that indicated that, uh, you know, they're, they're more animal uh in their in their biology and less human um and actually after she died uh, a different uh horrible white supremacist doctor came along and uh stole her body uh and uh dissected it but with emphasis on her her genitalia as well as her uh her buttocks um and uh wrote, I think it was nine pages on her vulva and uh, I think one sentence on her brain. Um, and uh, her uh, body and parts uh, were actually in a museum in France until, uh, I'm going to see if I can get the details here, uh, until I think it was 1985, yeah, in the museum. And uh, that was just on display and that her body was just on display until 1985. And even after that, uh, she was not returned uh, to uh, her people until 2002. Uh, so the museum was just holding on to the body, I believe, that whole time. Um, so, uh, yeah, really intense stuff. I want to acknowledge that. Um, and it doesn't end there. Um, so uh, we also have a strong anti-masturbation movement uh, and uh, that uh, goes right alongside genital cutting. Um, you have probably heard of uh, Kellogg. Yes, that Kellogg. He was a doctor focused on uh, general well-being and promoting a healthy lifestyle. And so he tried to come up with cereals that were helpful to people. Um, and that is the same guy who uh, regularly performed 
clitoridectomies and advocated uh, what is essentially the sexual assault of children to make sure that they were not masturbating um, and uh, just just really, really bad. Um, there's a lot more that I could go into on him, but I have some uh, sources in, in the uh, notes for later. Um, but yeah, not a not a good dude. Um, that's uh, that's Dr. Harvey Kellogg, serial man. Um, moving forward from there is we go into the 19th century, and this is more when the transition from seeing women as lustful to seeing them as asexual happens. Um, and that's where we get the modern sexism, where women want emotions and men want the physical urges of sex. Um, and, uh, and that's why we get these contradicting ideas that women are hormonal, but also they, you know, don't, uh, care about like physical pleasure and just want feelings. Um, so we, you can see some of the contradictions coming about, uh, that are, are more modern, uh, in, in that, um, there's, uh, uh, again, like all of these things interlap and uh, overlap and intersect, right? So we have uh, overlapping with the, the anti-masturbation and genital cutting, we have a strong sense of transphobia. Uh, John Money, another former doctor, uh, still alive, uh, performed uh, a lot of uh, surgeries on, on intersex infants, uh, determining, you know, what, what sex or gender they would be and, and assigning that onto them uh, without any kind of, you know, waiting until they can decide or anything like that. Not to mention, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I got confused. Uh, John Money, yeah, uh, did the intersex surgeries. The clitoridectomies are that ex-doctor that I was talking about who uh, that's, uh, Dr. Burt, who is the one who's still alive, and um, he performed, I believe it was uh, hundreds, if not potentially thousands of clitoridectomies, many without consent, um, and had no scientific basis uh, for this. He, it was just ideas he had, right, about how uh, the, the genitalia should be if we wanted to... Uh, uh, maximize pleasure in the way that he thinks uh, need, we need to be having pleasure, which is to say, you know, uh, missionary sex, man on top, and like never, no foreplay or like anything. Um, and and when you force a human body to fit into like your idea, you're going to commit violence. Um, that's, and that's what he did. Um, the clitoris, again, the fact that it's controversial that it even exists, uh, there are, I believe, still medical textbooks today that do not actually show uh, the clitoris in, in the diagram or, or, or at least label it. Um, but certainly, like, the, there's a, one of the most popular medical textbooks that didn't show it until, I want to say it was the 80s. Uh, I can double check that. Um, but uh, but yeah, the the size of uh, the clitoris was unknown by white medicine because again, uh, people were familiar with this. If uh, if you uh, cared to include their knowledge into your uh, pool of of data, um, but unknown by white medicine until 1998, uh, which that it's an organ. Like the idea that we that there's would be an organ of the the of uh, traditionally thought of as men's bodies that we didn't even know the size of or or was controversial about its existence until 1998. That's yeah, there's a lot going on there. Um, and then uh, there is something called the husband stitch, which uh, is practiced uh, by some today. Uh, it's controversial about uh, how uh, frequent it actually happens, which it's hard to say. Um, but uh, the idea there is that um, during childbirth, it is entirely possible for uh, the external genitalia to tear somewhat. Um, and when that happens, it is uh, medically justified to stitch up that area. Um, there's something called the husband stitch, which is an extra stitch to uh, make things tighter 
down there in the idea that it will be more pleasurable for the the uh, partner with the penis. Um, and it's called the husband stitch. It's a super gross name uh, for a super gross thing. And I'm going I'm to keep that gross name for it. Uh, but um, uh, that that is done to uh, people without their knowledge or consent and can cause complications, uh, just as uh, Dr. Burt uh, ruined a lot of people's lives with his the complications that he created and, and not to mention the, the trauma of, of enduring that. Um, and then uh, one thing I want to emphasize here is that like the very nature of sex uh, which is to say like intercourse of penis and vagina uh that itself is a social construct um and i'm going to say that again sex itself is a social construct um they're not like obviously there are people who uh don't engage in penis and vagina uh sexual uh intercourse um and uh they are still engaging in sex. And there's a lot of different uh, I ideas and, and meanings uh, to the word sex for people based on, you know, whatever activities they're engaging in. Um, but all that is to say that uh, we cannot remove um, the, this, the medical information and the science from uh, the, the social context that we're in. Um, and we need to understand one and the other. And if we try to go into these things, not understanding that uh, we are influenced by white supremacist, heterosis, patriarchal, capitalist domination culture, we're just going to enforce it in incredibly violent ways, the way that uh, these people did. A um, couple things to add. Uh, uh, some There's some quotations here. Um, also from the book Fruit of Knowledge, the revelation by Masters and Johnson, famous uh, sex researchers, that the female orgasm is almost entirely clitoral would have been commonplace wisdom to every 17th century midwife. Again, uh, midwives uh, and and uh, many people before them and, and some people after uh, were way more familiar with uh, the, the human body than uh, the general public is today. Um, and even many doctors, many medically trained people. Um, and then one one point I want to emphasize too in the conversation around genital cutting is um, it it does happen to uh, uh, male infants or or uh, infants with penises. Um, I'm I'm not in favor of that, um, and uh, and I you know I I condemn it. And there is something different about uh, quote unquote female circumcision versus quote unquote male circumcision. So I'm going to read this quote from a paper uh, that I have, have sourced in the, in the notes here, um, which is female circumcision reflects an underlying message about the status of women and an intention to affect their sexual function and behavior. Importantly, Male circumcision does not intend to affect the male's future sexual behavior or communicate a lower status of males. Um, so it's there is actually history in uh, the male circumcision being rooted in this idea that it would decrease masturbation. So you know you can argue that it uh, was originally designed to affect male sexual behavior. Um, but that's certainly not the the primary reason it's performed today, um, which, you know, there it's like there's talk around it having medical benefits. Uh, but if, if it does, it's super minor. Um, and uh, and I would certainly argue not not worth the uh, pain and trauma that I imagine an infant would be going through. Um, but it does not have this. Uh, this subjugation of a person based on their gender, the way that quote unquote female circumcision does. Um, not to mention that uh, uh, female circumcision is, has far more complications associated with it afterward. Um, and uh, it, it is entirely uh, rooted in uh, altering sexual behavior. There, there's no 
uh, uh, argument at all about uh, having any health benefits. Um, so uh, while I am against genital cutting of any kind, I do think that uh, the genital cutting of uh, the the clitoris or general vulva or quote unquote female circumcision uh, carries with it more uh, oppression behind it. And, uh, and I think that that is, is worth emphasizing. Um, so that is the history of uh, patriarchy and genital medicine and science uh, by time. Um, and now just to go through some notes here, um, the lower left corner here is uh, around uh, sex and socialism in general, um, and uh, some of the stuff that you can uh, find uh, from my sex bio or me personally. Um, and then over here in the corner uh, or on the right side, um, there's uh, some of the main sources I pulled from. Uh, Behind the Bastards is that podcast that emphasizes uh, uh, the ex-doctor who uh, performed those clitoridectomies. I'm going to add in the one about uh, Harvey Kellogg as well. Um, and then uh, I'll also emphasize uh, that Fruit of Knowledge comic book again. The OBGYN reacts is a great uh, OBGYN YouTuber. And um, that period podcast, it's a podcast dedicated to uh, the menstruation and understanding it. And it's it's super, super fascinating. A lot of things I myself did not know and, and would not have learned uh, from uh, just living my life uh generally um but you know i'm trying to uh to understand experiences that i don't typically have um and then i do think uh it's important especially for people like me heterosis men uh to uh engage in art uh that emphasizes uh and and praises uh uh quote unquote female anatomy um like pussy riot and little kim and being able to say those words um and and do so i mean if you think about like women having to uh uh, uh accustom themselves to um uh love songs written by men and movies written by men and stories written by men uh i think there is a benefit to us heterosis men uh doing that uh with art written by women in in uh, no uncertain terms. Um, and then some articles here, again, uh, trying to emphasize that these things do happen in the US. Um, and child marriage kept coming up whenever I was uh, looking at these kinds of uh, uh, articles and information, so I included that there. But then the second page of resources, this is entirely dedicated to female genital cutting um, and uh, a lot of really good stuff, especially uh, videos from people who have been cut, um, which I think is important to hear their voices um, and to to center them in this conversation. Um, and uh, yeah, whatever whatever style of uh, information you most appreciate, whether it's podcast, video, article, uh, or or what have you, uh, I've got you covered. Um, so this has been. Uh, my Sex Bio's May edition of Fucking Capitalism, uh, Patriarchy and Genital Science and Medicine. Uh, thank you so much for coming, um, if he, or, or watching, rather. If you were to have attended, because um, again, this is a, a, a facilitate conversations here. So if you, if you attended, the questions that I would have posed to you for the breakout groups uh, were, would be these two questions. So first I would ask you, what forces have shaped your relationship to your own genitalia? Uh, and then we would break out into a group and talk about that. Um, and that might be, you know, your personal genitalia, or that could be all genitalia that quote unquote looks like yours, uh, whatever that means. Um, and, uh, and we would talk about that and have that discussion. Then the other uh, question if for the breakout group is, what forces have shaped your relationship to other genitalia, genitalia that is not your own? Um, and that could be any genitalia, not your own, or uh, genitalia that uh, doesn't look like yours. Um, and, and we would discuss that. Um, a big part of the series here on fucking capitalism is to make those connections from the grander political economy systems to our own personal lives. And so that's uh, typically the way it works is that I give this kind of presentation and then we have these discussions trying to like bring it in, make it personal. Um, so that's the idea. 
again, my name is Pierce Delahunt, and I so appreciate your watching. Um, please do check out our offerings at My Sex Bio or, um, or what I have uh, to offer from my articles or videos or whatever. Um, so, so grateful for y'all and solidarity because uh, there's a lot that we need to, uh, to work toward um, and change. I appreciate your, your doing that. Thank you.